thank you for uh, inviting me to participate in this uh, session today. Um, I'd like to first of all congratulate the organisers for a great program. It's uh, not often you get an opportunity to hear from all the players in, uh, who are affected and involved in assessing fitness to drive. Um, I've been involved in uh, reviewing the guidelines and was also involved in the review in 2003. So my uh, role today is to introduce the new standard which came into effect on the 1st of March to give you a bit of background about it and to provide a very, very quick overview of some of the changes. You might be aware that the first uh, uh, edition of Assessing Fitness to Drive came out in 1998 and that dealt only with private vehicle drivers. The major review in 2003 combined private and commercial vehicle driver standards and we're still uh, in that position and the current standard is similar. So in, in reviewing the standard this time, as in all reviews, we really sought to continue to improve the process and continue to improve how we manage health conditions with respect to driving. We've drawn on uh, evidence from many sources, evidence about how health conditions uh, affect driving tasks, evidence about crash risks, including coronial inquiries, evidence from consumers in terms of how the standards affect them, from health professionals in terms of how usable the standards are, and from driver licensing authorities and the transport industry. So it's been a, a comprehensive review and involved uh, many people. Ultimately, the, the, the review is aimed to retain that and maintain that balance between uh, road safety and uh, a driver independence, which as you can imagine is a, a tricky one when you, you all deal in the field. One of the ways of trying to improve the way we manage it is to make it simpler. So a lot of the changes to the standards are structural and hopefully will make them easy to use for you. In two, the 2003 edition had 23 chapters. Uh, we've now reduced this to 10, trying to really focus on the conditions that affect fitness to drive. So you'll notice some of these conditions uh, affect Acute ability to drive, blackouts, epilepsy, uh, sleep disorders. Others affect functional capacity like musculoskeletal disorders and vision. Perhaps one of the um, red herrings in there is hearing, which there is not a lot of evidence for how hearing affects crashes. It has been retained because the licensing authorities felt there wasn't enough evidence the other way. So the next review will really focus on, on hearing. So we've also sought in practical terms to improve the, uh, the guidance for health professionals so that they can um, undertake this difficult task more easily. There's more information um, courtesy of the Monash University Accident and Research Centre literature review about how health conditions affect driving and also uh, what the crash risk is associated with various conditions. The new standards emphasise uh, functional capacity uh, rather than diagnosis, so in that way it's, it's fairer and, and easier for health professionals uh, to manage. We've also tried to incorporate uh, more assessment tools and more guidance around how to assess the patient as well as um, flowcharts to guide the decision making process. Just one example of one of the flowcharts we've incorporated showing the various um, causes of blackout. Uh, and guiding you to the different parts of the standard uh, depending on what the cause is. We've also endeavoured to provide greater clarity. A lot of the feedback from health professionals was that the standards were expressed in a rather complicated way. So the, uh, we've used simplified language. We've also endeavoured to emphasise that in the, in the wording of the standard that it is the driver licensing authority who makes the decision about licensing, not the health professional. And I think often that's one of the very difficult things for you is that your patients feel that you're taking their licence away. So the wording of the standard is very much around health professionals providing information about whether certain criteria are met. The driver licensing authority then combines that information with a range of other information to make the licensing decision. So just looking very quickly at some of the specific changes, you'll be aware that part of the standard uh, there are um, recommended or minimum non-driving periods for certain conditions designed to help health professionals gauge how long they should keep someone off the road after a health um, uh, procedure or a condition uh, to, as a general piece of guidance. Obviously it's uh, a minimum requirement, uh, not a, a recipe book approach. 
but we found these are, are quite helpful, but some of them um, have been impractical uh, and some of them have not represented the risk of the condition. So just some examples with the major changes. Uh, with epilepsy for commercial vehicle drivers, the seizure-free non-driving period has increased from five years to 10 years, which seems a lot, and it is a lot, but it is in line with uh, international standards. Some of the non-driving periods have been reduced. Uh, so with um, acute myocardial infarction for commercial vehicle drivers, I think it was three months, it's been reduced to four weeks. That doesn't mean that every commercial vehicle driver goes back to driving his truck after four weeks, but it reflects that we are now able to assess drivers at four weeks as to whether they are capable of going back to driving. So that's fairer for them. Also, we've introduced non-driving periods for some conditions, uh, and a, a good example is drug and alcohol dependence. Um, and th that means that we can biomedically test uh, people's remission, so that's a fairly feasible non-driving uh, scenario. Periodic review is another way we manage people with health conditions. Um, people with um, conditions like diabetes, progressive conditions <coughs> like dementia. The periodic review process uh, through Vic Roads is designed to help monitor diseases so people can stay on the road for as long as possible um, and also to um, make, pick up any changes in, the, in their condition, for example, like psychiatric conditions. So uh, for some of these periodic review uh, areas, we've relaxed the requirements. Uh, for commercial vehicle drivers where specialist review is required, we've found that that's impractical for common conditions like hypertension and diabetes controlled by um, drugs such as metformin. So GPs are able to review those patients. We've also increased periodic review for some conditions or introduced periodic review. Dementia now requires uh, reporting to Vic Roads for assessment for a conditional licence at the time of diagnosis. In the past, it was uh, reportable at the time of significant impairment. And this aligns with other conditions like diabetes, where it's a progressive disorder, that they need to be monitored frequently in order to um, monitor their, their risk. There have also been some, uh, a range of changes for um, in the licensing criteria. Uh, I didn't mention earlier some of the chapters that had actually been removed. So there are now no longer um, specific criteria for diseases such as renal failure, liver failure and respiratory failure. By and large, the effects of those conditions are on uh, things like cognition, which are covered elsewhere in the standards. So that's how we've managed to reduce the uh, numbers of chapters. Other uh, conditions that no longer have criteria, uh, there's, no, there's not a cancer chapter because in the end cancer affects various end organs and it didn't make sense to have a, a, a chapter on cancer. Uh, short term conditions like um, pregnancy and anaesthesia, there's no longer specific criteria for that. There's some general guidelines in part A about temporary conditions uh, like that. For other conditions where the feedback was that the standard was a bit vague and was causing uh, inconsistent decision making, we've introduced more specific um, criteria. So monocular vision now has a specific um, criteria and so does things like subarachnoid hemorrhage. So all these, there's a document on the Austroids website that summarises all these changes. So I urge you to have a look through that. It's about 10 pages. Uh, which is easier than trying to uh, hunt through the book. <coughs> so one of the areas that um, um, may affect you in, in regional Victoria is access to specialists, and this has been quite a controversial issue. In 2003, when we um, combined the commercial vehicle standards with the private vehicle standards, one way of differentiating in terms of risk for commercial vehicle drivers was to require that for conditional licences, they needed to be reviewed by a specialist. Now, access to specialists is, is obviously a challenge um, and you can imagine through this review we had a lot of arguments for getting rid of specialist review entirely, particularly from uh, central Queensland, and ba balanced against the very strong view of the, of the um, medical experts 
that many of these conditions really couldn't be managed um, by the GP and, that, and they needed that input in order to ensure safety on the road. So we've made, um, as I said earlier, for common conditions like hypertension and diabetes controlled by metformin, a specialist uh, assessment for conditional licence is required initially. And then if the specialist and the GP and the DLA agree, they can uh, be reviewed by the GP subsequently. If there really is um, limited access for any other condition, so it's not um, necessarily diabetes or high blood pressure, if for any reason access to a specialist is, is difficult, then the DLA will um, uh, engage in a discussion about uh, what sort of input is required to uh, advise about a conditional licence for a commercial vehicle driver. Also, one of the uh, confusions that um, happened in Queensland in uh, referring commercial vehicle, <coughs> excuse me, commercial vehicle drivers to a specialist, they were actually taking them off the road for an assessment like early diabetes, which is not the intention of the standards. So a commercial vehicle driver who's applying for a conditional licence doesn't need to stop driving if they've got a condition that's not immediately going to affect their fitness to drive. So there's, in the part A, you'll find quite a bit more uh, clarity around how specialists uh, need to be used for, for those sorts of um, assessments. Uh, and we also encourage uh, you to use telemedicine uh, as well, that's an option. So in terms of uh, what NTC and Austroads are doing to get the word out, I'm told that the books are on their way and uh, I think OTs have received them this week. Good. Um, uh, but the other recipients are, all GPs in Australia will get a hard copy, um, medical specialists uh, in relation to the relevant areas will get a copy, OTs, optometrists and diabetic educators. The book will also be available uh, to be purchased online through Austroads, uh, so at $15 a, a copy. And I think um, bulk orders can be negotiated as well if you have a, a need locally. So I think in years gone by, um, bureaucracies like uh, the NTC and Austroads felt that when, once they distributed, that was implemented in their mind. <laughs> so we have uh, chipped away at that over the, over the years and, um, and I think we are making some progress, but I think implementation really relies on you at a local level to conduct th this sort of session uh, to en engage you locally in, in education. Um, so I think we're still very much reliant on that. However, we are, um, over the next six months, there'll be quite a lot of general communication through health professional organisations, through transport organisations, through a variety of groups to alert them to the new standard and through consumer uh, organisations as well. We've produced a very short fact sheet which just talks about responsibilities of the patient in relation to driving. It's quite a handy um, fact sheet to, to give to patients when you're talking about um, fitness to drive. But um, Vic Roads and the various consumer organisations also produce some terrific resources. Uh, so I urge you to go out and have a look for those. And there's, I think, a lot of them displayed in the uh, room outside today. One of the things we're uh, slowly making progress on, and I think is really essential for GP management, is to try and integrate some decision-making tools into... Thank you. Um, decision making, making tools into GP uh, practice software, doctor practice software, and we're already having some quite useful discussions with the major software providers. So I think that will be, if it comes off, quite revolutionary in, in how we can um, encourage a, a doctors to manage this in a routine way. We'll also be continuing to liaise with major stakeholders. If anything comes out of today, for example, we'd be very keen to hear about it in terms of ideas. NTC and Austroads now see maintenance and implementation as an ongoing function rather than just um, turning off their ears uh, and waking up in five years' time to think about it, So, which is great. And I think also, um, finally, you're very fortunate in Victoria to have uh, really great support at, at Vic Roads through the medical review area and through uh, the Victorian Institute of Forensic Medicine. Very few states have this level of support uh, where they can actually get uh, sensible advice about individual patients uh, and about the processes. So I encourage you, you to use them and, um, and support them because it's quite a, 
a unique service and we have struggled to get other states to take that on. So if you want to find out more about the re review and supporting resources, the Austroads website is the place to go. That It has a comprehensive project report which explains all the changes uh, from a medical viewpoint and explains the impact on licensing authorities and consumers and health professionals. And if you really want an interesting read, uh, have also a look at the Monash University report. And finally, just acknowledging the very many players who've been involved, in particular Dr Bruce Hocking, who's been the medical advisor on the project. Thank you. Thank you.